thank you all for coming. Dave Tott is the co-founder of the Buffer Bloat Project. He's an architect of the Cerro WRT reference router project, which is installed on countless uh, Wi-Fi access points. Uh, he's also the original implementer of the Cottle algorithm in Linux, which is the IT algorithm these days at the IETF. Um, prior to tackling buffer bloat, Dave worked on wireless mesh networking, spacecraft, voice over IP, and embedded Linux. He's been working on Unix drive systems for 34 years. Uh, Dave lives a nomadic life. He spent last summer uh, among the Sequoias in Los, Los Gatos. Los Gatos. Yeah, Los Gatos, California. And uh, now he, uh, in a yurt. And now he's on his East Coast tour, and I'm very honored that he's chosen MIT to give this talk. Uh, he's the CTO of Tech Libre and associated with the Lynx Lab in Paris and the ISC. His current research is sponsored by Comcast. Dave. Thank you very much for having me. Um, the Don Quixote of the Buffer Boat effort, uh, Jim Geddes is here. Next to him are Dave Reed and uh, Steve Bauer have also been participating in it. I'm really glad to have them here to kibitz and correct me when I'm wrong. Um, this is really two talks uh, in that I still feel very compelled to talk to the ongoing research and work on the Ethernet side of dealing with queue management. And at the same time, I really wanted to start addressing Wi-Fi this coming summer with some of this stuff that we've developed on the Ethernet and ADSL side. So I wanted to start with this plot. This is a fairly typical plot of behavior on a congested Wi-Fi link. We see latencies measured in seconds. I've been all over the world in my nomadic life, as you said. And well over 90% of the places that I've been exhibit behavior like that. This particular plot looks at things like voice over IP, which is this blue line, which is the VOQ, the next one is the VIQ, and the one here is the best effort queue. And you can see that the <clears throat> best effort is uh, pretty lame. For people that don't want to deal with the review, I've put up uh, a link to the minstrel paper, which is unpublished. Uh, if you'd like to get a copy of it today, please do so. Someday it'll be published. But, and I've pointed to several other talks that we've given before now. Uh, I recently had a chance to cover the entire history of network queue algorithms in about 60 minutes, 30 years worth of history at the University of Modena. And uh, last uh, two weeks ago, I had a chance to talk about the intricacies of Cottle and FQ Cottle. Um, at Stanford. Both of those were videoed, and I'm hoping that if you've seen, how many have seen these talks? Zip. Okay, well, for more background, go to that stuff. In dealing with the buffer blow phenomenon, we have to adopt some new terminology and some old terminology. TCP elephant flows are long running flows. What we used to use TCP for, big file transfers and things like that. TCP mice are short flows, and it turns out there's no official definition for that. So a short flow is, in my own definition, is something that just barely gets out of slow start. I mean, it gets out of slow start and exhibits just a little bit of sawtooth and then ends. And then we came up with a new term last year called ants. And these are tiny control packets that are being drowned out by these other kinds of packets, like TCP SYN and SYNAC, DNS, DHCP, NTP, itty bitty little packets that are really important to have around. And over the internet, the presence of elephants and mice drown out these things. Statistically, you can't see them, they're invisible. But if you don't have them, the internet fails. And that's why we call them ants, because they kind of keep the ecology working. Jim and I have had to do this slide I don't know how many times. I would like to stop doing this slide. Um, but TCP IP has two core behaviors to it. The first one is, is this itty bitty little thing called slow start. When a new connection starts, it exponentially ramps up to what's called SS thresh. And then it starts going up literally as a count function of the returned acts until it gets a drop. And then you see what's called a conventional TCP sawtooth. TCP's behavior is what we've been battling on the internet of late. A single connection fills any size buffer on the path bottleneck queue. And if you don't timely drop those packets, 
you get extraordinary latencies, problems with admission control, um, and stuff like that. There's a standard for IW2, is originally how TCP slow start worked out. It went to IW4, which means you had a starting segment window that was this big, and there's a proposal to make the starting segment window be IW10 and scale up from that. And dealing with those things that the kinds of bandwidths that are common throughout the world, megabit, two megabits, really impacts interactive performance. So better queuing is essential. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the congestion window per se. A lot of people have been doing research into that. Um, and most importantly, it's the reaction of additional buffering to TCP's behavior is quadratic. The more buffers you have, the vastly worse your latency and responsiveness and control gets. Thing is, of late, um, I like to think that the TCP sawtooth problem has mostly been solved. And I've been looking much closer at the mice and elephants and in real traffic. And in this particular plot, they just took samples over time and plotted them together to look at what other packets were on the link. You'll see that this is an elephant. And there's plenty of other traffic happening at the same time. And mice are completely running around the elephants. And there's no way of looking at this plot to see how, what the impact on the user was, what the impact was on the overall flow. So I've been working on working much harder at the slow start behavior of late. And coping with really bad benchmarking. The entire internet industry goes around measuring packets per second and just pump zillions of packets through a switch or a router over the there, measure that, that's the bandwidth, that's our product, and we ship it. And this has led inexorably towards having really, really deep buffers to be able to get that perfect extra half a percentage point of bandwidth. And latency just hasn't been part of the benchmarking scheme. And measuring TCP traffic in particular hasn't been part of it. So I sat down and tried to come up with a measurement that would look at real traffic and real network behavior across real, sometimes synthetically heavy workloads, try to optimize for existing traffic types, particularly web and VoIP traffic, and look hard at how to share it with your friends and neighbors and your family, and uh, stared at that for like over a year. While I'm ranting, um, this one really bugs me. The five bars metric. You get your phone, you got your five bars. That's great. It shows you how well you're receiving the tower, but it doesn't tell you how well the tower is receiving you. I'd like to fix that one, too. And uh, I came up with this test called the real-time response under load test. It tests TCP, not UDP. It loads up a link with four up and four down streams. And I developed it originally because I wanted to look at Wi-Fi's queue handling, um, meaning that I used the concept of VI, VO, best effort, and BK to exercise what people thought was a solution for Wi-Fi. And it tests not just classification, but I also had set it up to use the same scheme to do IPv6 and IPv4 at the same time, RTT fairness over multiple differences, as well as different forms of TCP. It's a bunch of simpler tests in the suite, but I'm mostly going to show off quickly the kinds of stuff that I can do with this. So here I am taking a hard look at the behavior of IPv6 versus IPv4, <coughs> one classified best effort, one classified BK. And I was tickled. Uh, IPv6, for some reason, seems to be mildly better than IPv4 on this particular link. The other really core part of this test for me is that looking at these two different TCP streams at the same time, and latencies on different kinds of traffic, I can get a grip for the latency under load and the amount of buffering on the link. This has been really crucial in seeing these two things together at the same time for the first time. Similarly, I looked at RTT Fairness. This is a machine on the east coast, west coast, machine on the, on the east coast, machine over in, in Germany, and tried to compare them. 
This black line is the average of all the four streams. So you can determine your uplink, your downlink bandwidth, in this case, by multiplying this by four. The same time I was running this particular test, I was also testing a website called 163.com. More on that later. And lastly, if you're into things like delay-based TCPs or other form of TCP, you can compare four different TCPs at the same time against each other. So I ran this particular test against Reno, Westwood, Cubic, and LP. And um, when I put up the slide, I said, hmm, Westwood's behavior looks a bit odd compared to the other TCPs. It shouldn't do that. I'm kind of hoping that's just an anomaly in that particular test run, but we'll see what happens. So, I think there's a question. yes. Yeah, on, your, on the first of these series of plots, when you commented on the V4, V6, um, is, is there a different path? That, I don't know how long this, this Very good source question. is, because they would think that Typically, well, no, I'll let you get it. Um, part of the point of this test is to load it up like this and then run other tools at the same time. And part of the specification is running MTR. So in, in this particular test, I would definitely be running two MTRs, uh, uh, multi uh, trace route, simultaneously to expect the two different paths that this might be taking. And was that the case? Or Not in this one, no. Um, it takes 60 seconds to run this test, so to be able to uh, and investigate that would take another 60 seconds. Very helpful. Uh, before I had all this stuff, it used to take me hours to get a plot, hours to set up a test setup, hours to project a scenario. And now I, I've generated so much data I can barely sort through it. <laughs> the code is open source, it's available on GitHub. So at the end of all that, all the data you collect with your different variables for maybe your different TCPs or your different scenarios, your different RTTs, you can then pull out the data and really easily create a CDF plot. Now, none of these plots are related to each other. I'm just showing these as examples. But this last one here shows the kind of results that we ultimately got with using CODL, SFQ CODL, and FQ CODL on reducing latency under this load. If I were to show what a drop tail queue was, I don't know, am I still on camera? No. Am I still on camera? No. I think we're about here. <laughs> it's no longer worth showing what a drop tail do queue does under these particular circumstances. And we're looking really hard at reducing latencies from a, a really amazing result from Coddle of, of a, you know, roughly 50 ms um, at the queue to where we are able to hold it down for sparser traffic consistently to David, not very much. David. Yes, sir. Yeah, it just it's probably worth pointing out that that environment was an environment that suffers from buffer blow. Yes. And that's why the drop tail queue was useless. Yes. I mean, if you get small buffers, drop tail would not be dramatically different. So yes. We would have, we would reintroduce problems with admission control and stuff like that if we had a shorter queue in that particular instance. But in that particular case, I didn't have control over the outside queues. I had to use a rate limit to go. So it's kind of my hope that by putting this testing scheme into play at equipment vendors and device driver makers, et cetera, that they might actually look at the behavior of TCP, which is the most commonly used protocol on the internet, and look at the behavior of voice over IP, and look at the behavior of DNS, and try to build better hardware. That said, the pots are pretty complex. And despite all that, all the pretty sawtooths and stuff like that, it's not why it's there. The point of doing the test is to load up the link and to analyze the behavior of other stuff. So this is an example, by the way, this is just a bug in the plot, of running the same four streams up, four streams down, against one of the most heavily sharded, crazy websites there, 163.com, which takes about 16 seconds to load. And you can see the impact of loading that page 10 times using the Chrome benchmark and the overall effect on latency. I run the same test for the drop tail queue. I don't really want to show that one. It, it's really ugly. <laughs> Later on in the same test series, this is with no other test running, I uh, uh, tried it against Xfinity. I now have data against about uh, the, at least the top 1,000. 
sorting through it's going to take a while and I would like to automate it and do quite a few other things with it. So the result of a same style of test, website versus rule, I did recently against google.com and this was the result of a standard unshaped drop tail cue and a standard cable modem and this was the result of the same website load using the FQ Cottle algorithm. By running this test, I annoyed somebody else on the link. Oh, I don't know, just in this segment alone, I cost that other person well over 10 seconds of their time by running my test. So if I had a way of measuring annoyance, it would be great if I had some kind of metric that showed that. But I can certainly say that using FQ Cottle on a, on a, and having a congested link and sharing it with others is way less annoying for everybody. So, very happy with FQ Cuddle. We have, uh, again, same cable modem. Really weird behavior, really amazing 30 second long sawtooth, these weird peaks here. Here you can see another 30 second long sawtooth, stuff exchanging size, and actually fairly small latencies compared to most of what we've seen in the buffer blooded universe. Only uh, peaking at a quarter of a second. To wear really nice sawtooths. This particular shaper implementation does prioritization, so priority stuff goes here, background stuff goes here, bandwidth is really nice. And we've reduced latencies and jitter to less than, ten, you know, less than 10 ms on average, with a couple peaks here and there um, on the same exact link. But let packets be packets again. Really like that. So, what? On, again on the prior, this one? Yeah, yeah, on that side. I'm looking at the, uh, well, this one against you, but I think well, there's one right after this. So, this is before, this is after. Yeah, that, that, that yeah, that, yeah. But, um, in the TCP upload, well, in the middle, the plot in the middle, yes. you know, I'm seeing the average, the black line looks quite level. Yes. And I'm seeing a lot of jiggling, you know, of the others. So the black the, line the, the, is an average of the sawtooths. Right. So it looks like this, what, what was intriguing me is the sawtooths seem to be to get a nice flat average. Don't I? It would almost imply the sawtooths are out of phase with each other. Um, so almost like they're oscillating back and forth. They should be out of phase with each other. They should hopefully stay out of phase with each other. Yeah. Um, one of the uh, things that Red uh, solved before this was what they called, uh, oh, help me, I just forgot the name for it. Originally called Rainbow and Glitly Grow. Yes. Glo TCP Global Synchronization, where we have a short tail drop queue in multiple TCP streams. I have a slide of that one, too. I didn't do it. Um, where you see all your sawtooths will synchronize, and all of them will drop. All yeah, your sawtooths yeah. synchronize and drop. And Red fixed that. And Cottle's uh, interesting use of an inverse square root and the t delay factor pretty much introduced the same level of randomness so you don't see uh, stream synchronization. Okay? All right. Any good AQM should be trying to solve that problem in the lab. Really goes on to TCP streams to be synchronized. Yeah, I, I would think you, yeah, I, that makes sense that you wouldn't want to, and that's. Seems to be the effect here that they were out of sync. Otherwise, that black line would have been jiggling also. So at IETF, uh, Van Jacobson, after having talked about Cottle, uh, verbally described his take on FQ Cottle after having some analysis of it. And he said, for sticking code in a boxes display Cottle, don't do that. Deploy FQ Cottle. And that's wonderful. Of course, right after that, he went off and tried to develop something slightly better than FQ Cottle. He and Kathy are working on an SFQ-based variant. Um, but it's still incredibly good stuff. And unfortunately, what happened right around then is that people read the ACMQ article on Cottle, where we called it a, a piece of the solution to buffer bloat. And they started slamming it into other, other stuff when they didn't quite get that Cottle itself is just aimed at being TCP friendly. It's very good at controlling anything that is a TCP friendly style stream, but it doesn't work well against ping floods. And it's also um, nowhere near as good as SFQ for um, 
basically dealing with stuff in slow start and things that are uh, classic web pages that are sharded and so on. It really helps to have flow queuing. Fair queuing and flow queuing is slightly different. To break up big packet streams into back into being packets again. So it's out there. As of today, I'm told that there is a kernel update for Ubuntu 12.4. It's really easy to turn on. One line of code for the basic stuff. We have put up some caveats for people benchmarking this stuff. Um, but I have been running this on my devices everywhere for the last year. And it makes things like Google Hangouts, web pages, etc., on Ethernet and Wi-Fi, on um, even mostly untuned systems, mildly better, and a little bit of tuning works a lot better. And we are working towards, hopefully this year, making something derived from this technology the default on Linux. So my plea to everyone here that has been doing research on network queue technologies, we're going to unleash something on potentially hundreds of millions of machines. Google's already deployed it. Um, we would love to have you rerun some experiments. Right check now, some of stuff. Or hold your peace. Yes. The train is leaving because <laughs> because um, uh, P five O fast is so terrible. We just can't in conscience wait very long. But it's out there to test today. Please beat it up. Please try to kill it. <laughs> <laughs> I have put a lot of traffic through. I've attacked this every way I know how. But having been part of the inside, I would like people from the outside to try to find a flaw. And it's been really, truly, we have reduced uh, internet latencies by multiple orders of magnitude. We've made configuration ridiculously simple. The algorithm itself can be implemented in very small devices like this one. Uh, I am working right now on, on finding ways to get it burned into hardware into even smaller devices like cable modems. It's good stuff. I'm Dave. Yes. Um, just because many people associate Linux with end devices, it's probably worth pointing out where this goes. <laughs> okay. Um, FQCODL itself can go anywhere. Sure. It seems to, um, AQM is not just for routers anymore. Right. It works well on servers, it works well on clients. Um, the core place where it needs to be going, I think I put it in the next slide, didn't I? I did. Um, is on the edge. Any place where there's a major fast to slow transition, uh, reduction in bandwidth, some way of managing that transition better is needed. So in devices like your home router, home gateways, DSLAM, CMTSs, those are really good places. On the edge of the data center where you're going at 10 gigabits out of the data center to where you're going to somewhere else where you're running at a gigabit. So in a load balancer, if there are ways to uh, break up the enormous streams being generated by larger uh, devices and networks into uh, turning missiles into shotgun pellets that spread out across the net. That's where it needs to go. It's worth pointing out that it doesn't require TCP. It helps other, oh, it works other with everything. friendly protocols. Yes. Everything, so. Yes. I would love to see, uh, I think this will make things like multi-path TCP work or multi, uh, SCTP. Um, those things work better. Uh, because it will balance much better across multiple exit points. Okay. So uh, it, it isn't just that we, most of the work has taken place on Linux. There's some ha work happening on BSD. I don't have any insight as to what's going on in Apple aside from seeing Stuart Cheshire's uh, ears perk up when we first started talking about it. Um, and I don't have any insight on Microsoft. Uh, Cisco has come out with something. Uh, that is a competitor to Coddle called P, not FQ Coddle, called Pi, built around a Pi controller. Um, the code is due out any day now. There's a draft and some of the algorithm. I'm looking forward to seeing that. But there, by means we're no, by no means done. There's plenty of research left to be done and improvements and tweaks, and I hope that people can look at the open issues. Please leave page if you're going to be benchmarking. <laughs> and we have a mailing list. Feel free to call. <laughs> um, how much time do I have left? You're halfway done. Good. Time that perfectly. So, I co-started the thing with uh, buffer blood thing with Jim, and we also felt that the biggest problem that we had was on the edge, on the edge modems. We started up another 
project called Sarawort, which has devolved to be my uh, success and my curse. It's a success disaster. There's a lot of people that run it. And it's just a research project from my perspective. But people put it in there, and their wives and children and families depend on it. And I'm experimenting with new algorithms and things. And Keeps you honest, Dave. <laughs> It, it sometimes gets under my skin. I, I put out all kinds of hysterical warnings, like this version may eat small children. Um, but by and large, the last couple releases have been very stable, and um, I have it deployed. I'll talk about that in a second. So the thing was, is what inspired me to give this talk is that the kind of behaviors that Jim and I have been seeing over the last five years have become, instead of being sporadic little incidents, become increasingly common. You have your standard OLPC story. You know, at least one of our failures, and there were several, was buffer block in a big way. 1,004 1, packets of buffering in, um, in a standard, uh, not in an OLPC. Four packets are in the wireless module. This is the first generation of OLPC. And 1,000 packets in PPIFO fast. And this is uh, one of the failures we had, and we had several others as well, um, figuring out we did not figure it out at the time at all. Um, and neither did I. I went down to San Juan del Sur in Nicaragua as part of OLPC to some extent. And they had the mesh failure thing. And I started building a much, oops, that's not the right one. Oh, I started building a much, where is it? Hold on. There it is. I went and started to build a uh, much, much bigger mesh network um, out of layer three technologies. And this stuff, you know, it ran for about 14 miles and had multiple directional radios, and, and it actually worked over wireless G. But I got ready to deploy it, and I switched to wireless N, and in the case of heavy tropical rain, all the physical layer statistics were dead on with the model, but the network failed completely. And I didn't figure out for over three, over three months, maybe six months after that, um, that what I was actually observing was uh, internal buffering well in excess of, of 30 seconds uh, when the rates dropped to the bare minimum. So these were just harbingers of things to come. Where am I? At IETF, well, LinuxCon 2013 had failures. The Olympics recently had a massive failure of everyone getting online. And uh, the funniest one, if you can get to this link, is at IETF, the premier geeky organization on the planet in Paris, the Wi-Fi network failed completely. And the people there were desperate. One guy took his cell phone and, and he had a, oops, it's on my cell phone. And he's next to his cell phone and he duct taped it to the ceiling of his bathroom. So he could get on Wi-Fi and he had Bluetooth to, down to that just so he could get his fix. And they ended up doing all kinds of crazy stuff to bring the network back. Notably, they had to turn off nearly um, every other access point in order to have a functioning network. These, this behavior seems to be replicated worldwide. People are just used to it, but you see it failing at conferences. You see it failing at hotels. Um, and the big place where I see it failing, um, I was in Paris recently. I could hear over 200 access points. Um, and I was lucky to get a few K per second of bandwidth. I just sort of talked through that particular slide. The biggest problem that I've seen, however, well, I've got a bunch, but I've been working on since starting the Sarawort project, is that it turned out that I could get classic congestion collapse in my lab. And that terrified me. That, also really motivated me to work on the buffer blow problem because I did think it was a harbinger of things to fund. The thing is, is that it turned out that that was a driver bug. And I've spent mesh many, many times, uh, I'd say about five major driver bugs in just this hardware alone, with some really top people working on it, looking at the source code, fixing those and improving Wi-Fi performance tremendously. The thing is, is that not everybody has source code. Not everybody's device gets updated. And there are millions of devices in the field that won't ever get updated. The infinite retry bug that was causing congestion collapse in my lab, we fixed that, I guess, about, I don't know, August before last? Yeah, probably before last. Yeah. About a year later, Broadcom had the same exact bug, where you would see pings that would, any kind of traffic, get repeated for up to 30 plus seconds. 
uh, through a specific path in the driver. So they pushed out a fix for that, but that means there's millions of devices in the field that are exhibiting this kind of behavior. Still, I figured that once we got a perfect and debugged router there, we'd be able to start working on what we identify as the next biggest problem in Wi-Fi, which seemed to be queue management. So uh, last August, I established what I call the Yurt Lab. That's my yurt in a campground near Los Gatos. It is some of the most difficult terrain imaginable, covering 110 acres. And I put it here because in all of my travels, this was the first place I'd been where I could find no Wi-Fi signals. Um, I really felt strongly that I needed to have a place that had just my code emanating radiation in order to be able to fully analyze what was really going on. Now, it also happens that there are multiple residents here that use this stuff, and they have huge groups that show up on weekends, and in the winter there's almost nobody there. So I can set up a controlled experiment someplace where nobody is, up here on the mountain perhaps, and I can also take a look at what happens when a you know, couple hundred teenagers show up for a party with all their Android phones. Um, deploying it in August was a bit premature, but I just spent a couple weeks uh, updating it to the latest code, and I'm reasonably happy that this uh, meshy loop that I have from here to here is going to stay working, that the access points will keep working, and I'll be able to design a set of experiments, hopefully with some others, uh, and taking a look at each of the individual problems that Wi-Fi has. I'd be delighted to have uh, host any, anybody that would like to also look into this stuff at this location. I also have a lab at ISC and one at Comcast, which are a little bit less rustic and don't have a pool and hot tub. So we're going to look at tons of data, going to fix some more bugs. I've noted that multicast, I'll get to that in a minute, and management frames and access points appear to be a source of a major Wi-Fi problem that have all been minimized in this test bed. Um, and the biggest thing is that now that we I think we have a good algorithm for managing queues and doing flow queuing to try to move that into the radios themselves. It's already deployed at a much higher level in this uh, system, but it need, it's it deployed all the way up here in the stack and it needs to be much closer to the Mac layer. And then look up tons more data and wash, rinse, repeat. So what's wrong with Wi-Fi? Has anybody ever played with a Metricom radio or heard a strip? Two of us? Those were heady days. Nobody knew how to make this stuff work at all. <laughs> Metricom managed to raise a half billion dollars in funding over the course of most of a decade. They blew through it and they went under in 2001. Uh, but along the way they built some really neat hardware that they tried to use in a proprietary fashion. Um, and uh, the Mosquito Net group, which had uh, Mary in it and Stuart Cheshire, um, did some really interesting stuff. And I still cannot find the fundamental paper that said that we really needed to have one level of acknowledgement at the wireless layer in, layer in order to make things like TCP work. It, the original strip protocol didn't do that, and TCP wouldn't scale up. The packet loss was too extreme. And related to that, it turned out that the mesh networking was difficult without a central clock, so the concept of an access point arose. And from that, we got the idea of 802.11b. During that time, I'd uh, worked on the mosquito net stuff, and I'd uh, started playing with the very, the very first versions of 802.11, and I had a pressing need. I lived on a mountain, I had no internet. And I managed with my friend Greg Rutowski to come up with a way of hacking additional stuff to go 13 miles into the valley. And it was wonderful. We spent the next two years telecommuting and talking about we had massive geek cred and a lot of people read our how-to. And uh, yeah, let's go forward. But recently I just, uh, right here, I just, with that prior art we established in 1998, I ended up being involved in a patent case and helped beat that with what I'd published uh, back in 1998. And in looking at that, 
crystal ball was really unclear. I had no idea what was going to happen. We saw at the time Wi-Fi wi links were three grand a piece, and getting a, a, a PCMCIA card was about 600. And you can work with Moore's Law and cost effectiveness and, and think out five years, but thinking out 10 is really hard. Um, so I thought we would use things, you know, it's one of the things I worked on. This is a uh, work on handhelds.org too. This is a Nokia 770, and it ran X Windows and SSH and RSync, and it did all that in 19, and sorry, 2000 or so. Really cool. So I thought that we would offload the compute resources to other boxes that would broadcast to the Wi-Fi. It's not really what happened. Um, so we published that stuff. Wi-Fi started to explode in 2002. And what got designed looked a heck of a lot like, like what we did in 1998. And they skipped a whole bunch of things that we didn't publish. By 2003, for doing um, our downlink, we'd actually added queue management. We were using a thing called Wondershaper, which leveraged HTB and SFQ. It worked great. And we gave up on pushing DNS down a fairly lossy link. We just switched to using TCP proxies for that last hop. And we were routing, not bridging stuff together. And even then, with a the sudden takeoff of, of, of uh, Wi-Fi, we had to switch to a dish about this big <laughs> in order to transmit the same amount of data, half the data, with twice the latency we managed to get in 1998. It was harbor of things to come. Didn't expect that the Wi-Fi networks would be bridged. Wi-Fi took off. Proxies died. What passed for QoS was just packet prioritization, not queue management. Web traffic, well, we actually established uh, that uh, website I pointed to you earlier. We had a web server in our house running over Wi-Fi, feeding our dog food uh, for that entire time. People don't do that anymore. Uh, we used it for SSH primarily. Uh, we didn't uh, surf the web per se, and even then web pages were smaller, but web traffic has become really huge. And Wireless N came out. I was really happy seeing Wi-Fi uh, moving into homes, people using it. It looked like it was promising, and I went to Nicaragua. And I thought I'd take the same technologies and try to find a way of getting it into the third world as a way of cheapening the last mile. Portions of it worked, but I ran through my smack into buffer bloat. That said, I don't consider buffer bloat some of the core Wi-Fi technologies the real problem. The real problem is radios, radio sighting, placement, analysis, and so on. In order to get, oops, I keep doing that get to here, I had to climb a lot of mountains with a GPS. And once I got those GPS sightings, I had to go plot them. I was really delighted, delighted to have Google Maps. But you look here, and this particular line of sight <coughs> went right through a mountain. didn't work. So it ended up influencing the shape of the network, all these different mountains and places to go. I had to end up climbing and falling down quite a few of these places in order to get something that just got Sites, a few sites coverage. Apartment houses and conference centers had the same problem. And while I was researching this talk, um, it turned out that one of my uh, core developers for the Sarah Ward project, David Lang, had gone and given a wonderful talk on his experiences and how to get a large, busy conference center network to actually work. One of his core findings of, of scale 20, 2012 is that he had something like 2,000 attendees and like 900, 1,950 uh, devices online simultaneously, one device per attendee. Wow. Now, I know I'm a little unusual. I carry around one, two, three, four, wait, what else do I got? Oh, yeah, this guy, five. Ah, anyone seen these? Android on a stick? Six. So I know I'd skew the statistics some. But I think the trend line is to more devices per person.
Wi-Fi is way too backward compatible. There's a framing header going back to 1998, which is transmitted at the lowest possible rate. And in the, that little header there is the payload. And really the only major thing that has changed from 802.11b to 802.11g to 802.11n to 802.11ac is the stuff going on in the payload. In order to stay compatible with all the previous releases, the size of this header is basically the same. Yes, each new version of this lets you compress this and use different rates for it, but the instant you try to be backward compatible with some other device on the network that isn't running the latest standard, the header length goes right back from here. So we went from where we had a really tiny payload to where we were squeezing 64K or you know, up to 64K into this itty bitty little space at a tremendously higher rate with this unbelievably huge frame. Wi-Fi evolved. It doesn't look anything like our mental model of Ethernet. It intermixes um, what the I and the ISO model doesn't look anything like the TCP model either. So, and there's also layers eight, and nine, and ten on the stack, uh, which include people and politics and money, and they're all integrated with the Wi-Fi stack. Um, I never thought that everywhere I'd go, I'd have to bring open my open my <coughs> Wi-Fi device and have to go to a web page and log and agree to a some legal agreement and log in. That wasn't designed into the protocols. Um, so uh, we have four, five, and six. So and, and error control um, more or less got introduced with wireless in, in that. Yes, sir. Ten minutes? Good. I'm almost done. Um, wireless in. Um, when it ships aggregate packets, they are checksummed all together. This is a bad idea in 1968, it's still a bad idea now. We have uh, authentication permissions, having a login at the website, and we have um, all this interesting stuff happening called, uh, with, I just lost my thread, um, happening at the data link and physical layer. But I think the elephant in the room, not the elephant, I would say the, uh, the camel in the tent, was introducing the idea that you could do an act on every transmit. That idea has gotten worse and worse and worse over Wi-Fi over time. And, you know, I would have liked that to have stayed at, the, at layer three. Buffering, eh, I want to talk about it. And moving forward, 802.11ac has two properties I like and two properties I don't. I don't have any experience with it yet. Still working on fixing 802.11n. It's going to take another couple years. Um, but it has a multi-user uh, spatial, multi-user MIMO, spatial stream. That's good. I like that. I don't know. And it's also making 80 megahertz channels mandatory. I think that we need more channels, not less, that we need a bandwidth discrepancy between how these things are hooked up to the internet, which is like you know, 100 megabits, we should, our Wi-Fi should be running at about that and we should be trying to interfere less with our neighbors, not part of 802.11ac. Since I only have 10 minutes, oops, there we go. This is an old slide of mine. This is actually <coughs> pack capture, what Wi-Fi looks like. Bandwidth is not a constant. That rate control scheme, still not getting there yet. Um, you, you transmit at one rate for a little while. Then you might not be able to transmit at all. And then you might send everything in a gigantic burst really, really fast. It's not how we mentally think of how our Ethernet networks work. And most of our protocols are designed of the idea of an isos isochronous stream of packets. <sighs> Multiple access points. We have a rate, uh, a bandwidth allocation, uh, a time slice <coughs> allocation uh, algorithm called EDCA, and it can be really easily gamed. I was in Paris, and uh, I marked all my packets at VI, and, and my internet got a lot better. I didn't care about anybody else at that point. I just needed my email. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going to be in trouble for this in 10. So, the core problem you have with 
getting data out with lots of access points, you have a thing called a TX op, and that's bound by the size of a frame going back to 1998. And in wireless G, you're lucky to get around 1,300 of those. You don't ever get more, you can, you can certainly get less. And if you add up, you have, say, you have 200 access points that are all trying to broadcast, you're really in trouble. Um, it makes a lot of sense to make aggregation work better. Oh, well, that was uh, one of five pages of SSIDs I scanned. Go ahead, five minutes uh, in Paris. And 802.11e is an idea that existed before wireless N. Wireless N has a thing called packet aggregation. And you can squeeze um, up to 64, 32, 42, some number of packets into a single burst on a single TX op. And that's great, except that if you combine that with 802.11e, the background traffic, or uh, the e traffic, you have to take two TX ops to transmit X amount of stuff. Dumb. Don't know any hardware that fixes that. And working on queue management, the management frames emitted underneath the physical layer when you have multiple access points are proving to be a problem. There was a paper I saw recently that terrified me. I don't have enough data on it. And of course, nothing drops packets. The average packet loss in this particular train uh, ping time was 14 seconds. <laughs> With the three minutes I have left, I wanted to talk a little bit about minstrel. <laughs> Rate control is a really interesting problem. It turned out when minstrel was developed in 19, sorry, in uh, 2006 and 2007, that it was faster to retransmit a set of packets at a higher rate than it was to fall down to a lower rate that may actually be more reliable. Really great paper on that. And um, wireless conditions change on very rapid time scales. So Minstrel adopted an exp exponential weighted moving average to look at a very short history of most recent transmits to calculate the best time to transmit. And in every study I've seen, Minstrel seems to be winning. The thing is, it's been used by hundreds of millions of people. The core research was against wireless G. The environment has changed significantly. And I would like somebody to take a hard look at it in light of current conditions. The statistics are awesome. You can see what rates are being used, what the probabilities are. I like it a lot. Now, can I go five minutes over, Keith? All right. So. I'll slow down just a little bit. It's been my hope for a long time to be able to leverage these statistics in a queuing algorithm, be able to, uh, from a brief history, be able to predict what you can actually transmit at. This is my own form of tachyons, I think, for trying to come up with a better way of managing queues. I also think that leveraging these statistics could be used in some kind of meshing uh, routing metric. I think they can also be helpful in uh, fixing the five bars problem. You can pull out the statistic from the other side and show the user what you're really being received at. Because most networks are very asymmetric. You may be receiving stuff at 15 megabit, but barely transmitting at one. Moving forward to the summer. We're going to have to commit major surgery on the Wi-Fi stack in order to take the FQ CODL algorithm, which is basically way up here, and migrate it into where the aggregates are managed and adopt per station queuing and access points. We hope that this will improve bandwidth tremendously. But as I've tried to point out, we may be trying to solve the wrong problem. Uh, David Reed over there turned me onto this really cool board called a Z board. Wow. Dual A9 cores and FPGA. Uh, you call what did you call it? The Raspberry Pi of digital signal signal processing. Yeah, that's, that's yes. I think it is possible to take back control of Wi-Fi chip design and a few other things to try to move the state of the art forward and as we find ways of uh, find the problems we'll maybe find better ways to solve them by taking back control. A couple other ideas I hope to be working on. Um, 
One of the things that's not obvious, I got two minutes, I guess, is that when you have bursty transmits and aggregates, you actually have a built in fast to slow transition. You transmitted everything, 42 packets, all in a bunch, and you decode them all in a bunch, and you could maybe do something more intelligent with them as you DQ them. What happens presently in Linux is that they get DQ'd in valuable order. And our results with using uh, SFQ seem to indicate to me that if we, DQ, if we uh, flow queued, fair queued them as we DQ'd an aggregate, that that might improve aggregate performance. And I uh, already talked about that. Another crazy idea, I'm not going to touch on that. <coughs> it's going to be hard, could use some help. So in summary, what's wrong with Wi-Fi? Tons and tons of bugs. Lousy tests for those bugs. Problems with backward compatibility, bad sighting, not enough channels, antennas, antennas are terrible, there's too many bloody access points, too many clients, bad rate management, bad queue management, and not enough people understand it. And I'm really amazed it works at all. But we are critically dependent upon it in our society. It's tremendously useful, and I would like more people to be working on it and making it better. Any questions? I'd make a comment, which is that I could give the same talk you did about Wi-Fi, about LTE. Yes. Um, and it turns out that, again, it's been raced to market. The original decisions maybe were not quite right. Now it's very hard to upward compatibly fix it. And, and it's all proprietary. I mean, it's something you didn't say is because it's all proprietary, you can't look inside it and you can figure out what's going on. So there's there is a need for opening up some of these things and maybe even fixing them uh, in, a, in a way that allows, for example, academics to actually measure what's going on as, assuming, as opposed to black box uh, behavior. I would like that very much. Yes? I'm curious about what, uh, you made some statements about the, uh, the rate selection algorithm and the Wi-Fi. Could you say why um, Minsky Different from the variety of other algorithms that are, that are out there that, are, that look similar? Were you here earlier? What's earlier? I put the paper up. Yeah. Um, so I would prefer to refer you to the paper uh, as to that. So the biggest one is the Minstrel got its name because it periodically, about 10% of the time, dances around all the possible rates that can use to contact the client. So it's like a, a wandering minstrel. So does that have other skills. Yeah. Yes. Um, I am not aware of anything prior to, uh, anything after minstrel that was better. There was a paper that had analyzed it um, about four years ago. That was pretty good. If you can refer me to a specific paper that takes minstrel and compares it to something else, I'd love to see it. It's that despite minstrel being the default and the standard not a lot of people had a chance to look at its guts. And that's why I put the paper up earlier. Would you like me to put that slide back up? No. Okay. Do you have one in mind? Well, there's many, many schemes. Yes. And in general, when one proposes a scheme, the burden of proof is on the proposer to demonstrate that they're better than previous schemes and sort of explain why. And uh, I've, I'm pretty familiar with this area, and I've read the minstrel description. Uh, it does pretty similar to sample rate, which is widely deployed. Sample rate was compared in the, in the Minstrel paper I gave out earlier. Okay. Um, so what I'm getting at more is what is the insider idea that if it is better, it makes it better? Um, mm. I really should just, ref I can just refer you to the paper and we can take this discussion offline. I'd, I'd, I'd throw in one thing, sure. which is the, the observation you made in the talk, which is that in actual propagation environments, which unfortunately are almost never the place where these things are tested, <laughs> sadly, um, in actual propagation environments, which uh, I play around with and so forth, that phenomenon of very short periods of really good channels is the norm rather than 
the non -board. And if, if you have any scheme that has the property that it can quickly learn and take advantage of that, you know, that, that's good. And that's one of the reasons why Minstrel was an interesting insight. But I think there's a meta point here, which is that uh, in search of controllability of tests, even where people are benchmarking more than what's being benchmarked, they're not benchmarking reality. Minstrel is actually relatively, relative to most things, benchmarked in, in interesting real conditions, which um, unfortunately it comes across as well in that paper as it might. In fact, one of the things I want to get Andrew McGregor to write more about when he does the published thing is the testing part. The conference he submitted that to, that paper to originally, wasn't interested in that, which is in fact the piece of that work which I thought was the most interesting. Again, that was the best that could be done as of 2006 or 2007, um, and it's past time for people to try to see if they can do better than instrument. But nobody's doing that that we're aware of. Also, also I, think, I think there are many papers that will do sure. with tests and experiments. And I would accept many of the things you say. My point is, again, my question is, what is the fundamental new idea that's interesting that makes it better? And the answer is going to be the standards. Really it's 2006 work. Right? It's, old, it's old data, actually. Yeah. I think, I think what Dave. What Dave's trying to say is, you know, now we have a Wi-Fi that has all its all its high rate stuff concentrated in a very short burst in the middle of low rate incompatible stuff, DSS, S. Um, you know, the complexity of the system is complicated. OFDM itself is multipath resistant, but the other stuff is not. Um, you know, and so we actually don't know what a good approach would be. Uh, in real environments, especially high multipath environments and so forth. Yeah. If you have a favorite, I will gladly test it here. Uh, that, that's and not this is still I nothing had. like. I'm curious what the intellectual idea was, but yeah. I think we'll read the paper. I've read, read the Mag Wi Fi web pages, and it isn't. The, the paper I distributed goes into much more detail than the Mag Wi Fi web page. Okay. Are there other, uh, let's get the, want to make sure we get some other questions. Sure. Were there any others? All right, great. Well, let's thank the speaker. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for